as I said, I have a lot of material to cover and I'm not going to rush it. If I can't cover everything, I won't cover it. It's okay. Conditional expectations. Which is where it gets interesting. So given a function f, or a random variable f, which is a measurable. By the way, can people read my handwriting if I write like that? I've gotten more and more cursive and people give me the thumbs up. So I get, okay, I can write as I usually write. Given an a measurable random variable and a sigma subalgebra b of a, what's the best b measurable approximation to f? Yeah. So for example, if you're looking at a function on the, the unit interval and your function looks like this, for example, and you're looking at the sigma subalgebra going coming from the dyadic filtration, A2, which I think you split into four sets. You've got these four dyadic intervals that generate the filtration. And a function is measurable with respect to this sigma algebra, if and only if it's constant on each of these dyadic intervals. So what's the best approximation to our function f that's constant on each of these dyadic intervals? The, the right answer under statistical assumptions and so on is you take the average on each of the intervals and you set that to be the value. So it's like an average sampling. So what do you got here? Something like that, something like here. I don't know, bad at taking averages. Maybe it's something here, I don't know. But whatever. So you get this step function corresponding to averages on each dyadic subinterval. And I've drawn it really badly, but you get the idea, I hope. And you can debate whether that's the best approximation to F, but I don't want to argue about that. It's the best. Or you can state it another way. If we know B, thinking of sigma algebras as measuring information that we know, if we know B, what's the best guess? at f. Thinking of f as somehow being generated by a statistical process and making a bunch of independence assumptions and so on, you'll arrive at this average on each set result. This is what's called a conditional expectation in the end. So this function we will eventually denote it as e b of f. There are other notations you can use like this or whatever. I'm going to use this one on the left. I don't know why. I'll define everything properly. So we have our probability space. From now on, I'm not going to write that omega AP is a probability space because you know from the form of the notation that this is a probability space. Does anybody have any objections? No. X is still a Barnack space and I am always going to write B space here. And let's take a random variable f, which is a measurable valued in x. And remember, I can choose which of the, the notation of omega a and p I write in this LP space, whichever one I want to emphasize here. I'm going to emphasize a sigma algebra because we're really thinking of measurability with respect to different sigma algebras. So we have an integral random variable and we have a sigma subalgebra of A. We're defining a conditional expectation of F given B and this is a, well, yeah, is a random variable which we call expectation BF, it has to be L1, it has to be B measurable and X valued. I'm just gonna note that this L1 of B measurable functions is contained in L1 of A measurable functions because B is a sub sigma algebra of A. So if your function is B measurable, then it's A measurable. There are no strong measurability issues here. You can check this pedantically if you want, but everything works out. And it has to satisfy the following property for all sets B in the sigma algebra curly B, 
the integral over b of this conditional expectation has to be equal to the integral over b of the original random variable. And these are Bochner integrals, of course. They're always Bochner integrals. This is the defining property of a conditional expectation. It doesn't say that they exist. We're going to prove that they do. Oops. Just as a quick example, I won't provide every detail here, otherwise it takes too long. Uh, if, if B is atomic, meaning that there exists a collection of subsets B lambda, lambda in some indexing set, uh, that's not B, that's curly B, such that, oh, sorry, I'm losing track of what I should say here. You need to have a collection of subsets that generates the sigma algebra. So every subset in the sigma algebra is given by unions and so on of these. Well, B has to be the smallest sigma algebra containing this set. All of these have to have positive probability. And if you can write one of these sets as a union of B measurable sets, then one of these two sets has to have probability zero. So these sets are minimal in a sense, minimal positive measure subsets that you can't decompose further into positive measure subsets. If you decompose it further, you've got basically something of full measure and something of measure zero. Think of counting measures. These are atomic. The points are the atoms. These B lambdas are called atoms, of course. So if you have an atomic sigma subalgebra, then for all F that are A measurable and integrable, your conditional expectation, and there is of course only one, is given as follows. It's a sum over all of the atoms of the characteristic function of the atom, tensor with the following vector, the average over the atom of the function, or the random variable. And you might call this vector here, the expectation with respect to the set B lambda of F. So this is the expectation of F given the atom or the event B lambda. And the conditional expectation with respect to the sigma algebra with these atoms is just given by a simple function. Well, it's not simple because this set, this sum is not necessarily finite. But on each of the atoms, the conditional expectation is given by the conditional expectation given that atom. So the conditional expectation is a function. It's a vector valued function. It's not just a single vector, but on each atom it's given by the conditional probability in a classical sense. This is not hard to prove, the proof's in the notes. I won't do it now. But this only works when you take an atomic sigma algebra because in general you can't decompose your sigma algebra into these minimal positive measure sets. You can always keep going smaller and smaller and smaller. Your probabilities approach zero and then you start to want to divide by zero here and something goes wrong. So this doesn't work in general. And the conditional expectation is basic. Well, this one here is basically what I drew in this example here. I had an atomic sigma algebra. What was it? A sub two. And I just took the average on each of the atoms. So what we want to do is show that conditional expectations always exist and that they're unique because you don't know from this definition exactly that a conditional expectation has to be unique if it exists. It is true, of course. I'll give you a proposition that I'm not going to prove. For all integrable random variables F, for all sigma subalgebras B of A, if you have two conditional expectations, Let's call the other one E tilde. Our conditional expectations of F given B. Then they have to be equal almost everywhere. Which makes sense because these exist as elements of L1, which are only defined almost everywhere anyway. 
almost everywhere modification of f doesn't change the defining property of conditional expectations. So of course, this is only almost everywhere equality. Right, now I'm not gonna prove that. That's not too hard to prove. The proof basically goes by proving it in the case of a real one dimensional space. So real scalars, just using a, a real, uh, an order argument, which is not too hard to do. Then you can get it for all real Banach spaces by this scalarization testing against functionals. And then you can get it for all complex Banach spaces by just taking real and imaginary parts. You can check the notes for that proof. Just to summarize conditional expectations are unique, but we don't yet know that they exist. They're unique if they exist. So let's move on to existence. And this is a nice proof. It's gonna use a lot of the material that I've already introduced up to now. It's gonna justify all this stuff on Buckner spaces that we slaved over. So let's do the scalar case first. We need to do the scalar case first, unfortunately. For all scalar valued integrable random variables, for all sigma subalgebras B of A, uh, there exists a conditional expectation with respect to B. Uh, furthermore, the operator that this defines that maps F to its conditional expectation given B is linear. And furthermore, for all P between one and infinity, including both endpoints, this operator is positive, which is important. And you can probably guess why that's important and non-expanding meaning that the LP norm of a conditional expectation is no bigger than the LP norm of the original function. There are a number of proofs of this. I know of, I think three at least, there are probably more. The probabilists surely know a couple of proofs. I'm gonna give a proof which is I think slightly different to the standard one just because it's a bit more fun and because I understand it better than the standard one. Also because it gives an interesting insight into what a conditional expectation actually is, what it's actually doing. So I'll prove positivity first, just assuming that it exists because this comes from the defining property. If you have an integrable F, which is non-negative, you want to know that your conditional expectation is also non-negative almost everywhere. Well, F is non-negative almost everywhere, being an element of L1. Then for all B in the sigma algebra B, the integral over B of the conditional expectation is given by the integral of B over B of the original function. This is the defining property of conditional expectations. And this is non-negative because F is almost everywhere non-negative. And this already implies that, well, not quite implies, but since the conditional expectation is B measurable, being positive when you test it by integration against every measurable subset is enough to guarantee that the function is positive, non-negative, which is, uh, exercise in measure theory, which I've included the proof of in the notes. It's a one-liner, really. It's a compact line, but it's a one-liner. So that's positivity. It just follows pretty directly from the defining property. But that doesn't help us prove uniqueness. We start prove existence. Sorry, we haven't proved existence yet. So let's move on to the existence. Let's fix P between one and infinity. F in LP. And we are going to construct the conditional expectation. In fact, we're going to construct a conditional expectation operator as an operator on LP. B 
we just construct the operator directly, forgetting about the functions. And we do this on LP directly so that we can get the properties we want on LP. We need to split into two cases according to whether P is one or not, because the case P equals one is a little bit harder. The key thing for P greater than one is that the Hölder conjugate P prime is less than infinity. Let's consider the inclusion map. We call it iota, however that's pronounced. Mapping LP prime of B into LP prime of A. So we're looking on the dual side here to do this construction and we're taking just an inclusion map. There's no problem in how to define this inclusion map. B is a, B is a sigma subalgebra of A, so LP prime of B is a subset of LP prime of A. This inclusion map is non-expansive or non-expanding, whichever is the correct terminology. So it's adjoint, I wrote a star, which maps LP prime of A dual into LP prime of B dual is also non-expansive because the norm of an adjoint is just the norm of the original operator itself. Now, what is the dual of LP prime of A? It's LP of A because P prime is less than infinity. L infinity, the dual of L infinity is not L1, but the dual of LP prime is LP as long as P prime is not infinity. The dual of LP prime of B is LP of B. So we have a map from LP of A to LP of B. This is our conditional expectation. It's just the adjoint of an inclusion. So let's define the conditional expectation operator to be the adjoint of this inclusion. Modulo the identification of LP as with the dual of LP prime, which we just do implicitly. So does this actually give conditional expectations of LP functions. We need to check that. We have to check the defining property. So let's look at all B measurable sets B. Let's write this integral out in a fancy way. Let's write it as the dual pairing of the adjoint of the the inclusion applied to F, that's what the conditional expectation was defined as. Let's write it as the integral against the characteristic function of B. Just think of it in this abstract dual pairing. The definition of the adjoint means we put the adjoint on the other side, or the original operator on the other side of this pairing, just by definition. And the inclusion doesn't change what this function is. It just sees it as being in a larger set. So nothing happens here. And this here is the integral of F on B. And there's your defining property of conditional expectations. Just falls out, it's magic. So just to sum that up, this thing we defined is a conditional expectation of F given B as we wanted. Do I want to say anything else about that? No, that's everything we wanted to prove, wasn't it? There exists a conditional expectation. Oops. The operator is linear by construction. It's positive. And by construction, it's also non-expanding because it's the adjoint of a non-expanding map. But that was all for P greater than one. The case P equals one. The place where the previous proof fails for P equals one is in this identification of the jewels here, which fails. So we need to think a little bit differently, but thankfully we have most of it done already. So P prime is infinity, that's a problem. L infinity of A dual 
contains but is not equal to L1 of A. So we'll argue by density. We're going to do a nice density argument here. Let's consider L2. Because we're working on probability spaces, L2 is contained in L1. And it's contained densely. This is classical measure theory, right? It contains the simple functions anyway. That's nice enough to have a dense subspace. L2 is dense in L1. And we have the conditional expectation on L2 from the previous step. So we have our conditional expectation map from L2 of A into L2 of B, but let's just write that as L2 of A. It does map into L2 of A, that's a larger space. And we want to extend this to L1 intersect L2, which is L2, but let's write it as L1 intersect L2. Want this to map into L1 by density. So we need to prove a norm estimate. So we need to show that if our input function is L1, then the output function is still also L1. So for F in L2 and for G in L infinity of B, which we note in advance is contained in L2 of B, we want to estimate the L1 norm of the conditional expectation of F. So we're testing against an L infinity function G. So let's do this test. So F's in L2, so this conditional expectation is defined and G is also in L2. And the conditional expectation is actually self adjoint on L2 by the construction. Uh, are we using, no, we're not even using that in fact. We're using that it's the adjoint of the inclusion map by construction. This makes sense because G is in L2. It's all sort of abstract nonsense, but this is how it works. <clears throat> so as before, using the inclusion map doesn't actually change the function, just maps it into a larger space. And now we just use Holder's inequality. This is an integral of F against G. So it's bounded by the L1 norm of F times the L infinity norm of G. So we take the supremum over all G in L infinity. And what this gives you is that the L1 norm of the conditional expectation of F is less than or equal to the L1 norm of F. So this is L1 continuity of the conditional expectation defined on L2. But L2 is a dense subspace of L1. So this tells you that this conditional expectation extends by density to a map L1 to L1. And of course the results be measurable. So, yep. So this map's defined. We still have one more thing to show. Does it actually give conditional expectations? This is being really pedantic because of course it does, but you need to prove that. So for all F in L1 and for all B in the Sigma algebra B, we have to check this defining property. So now F's just in L1. If F were in L2, we'd have this for free, but F's in L1. So what we do, we write this as a limit as N goes to infinity of the conditional expectation acting on Fn, where Fn is in L2 of A and Fn approaches F in L1 using the density of L2 and L1. And now because we know that the conditional expectation operator does what it should on L2 by construction, we keep this limit out the front and this is the integral of Fn. So this here is just the defining property on L2 functions. And integration over a set is continuous on L1. So you can put the limit inside the integral and you get the integral of F over B. And now we're done. It's just a little density argument to make sure everything works, but it does. Now, 
does that automatically give you the existence of conditional expectations for Barnack valued functions? Where does this proof fail for Barnack valued functions? It's incidentally the same as why the case P equals one isn't so simple. This duality that we have here for Bochner spaces might not always hold. Remember I said in the, the previous lecture or last week or at some point, whatever, you need this rat on nicotine property for this to hold. And we don't want to assume that. So we can't just use this duality argument. But we do have from this theorem that the conditional expectation operator is positive. And we do know from the previous lecture that positive operators always have bounded x valued extensions. So we're going to use that. Ah, before I forgot, we have a little proposition we need to use here. Something that follows from the proof of the previous result for all p between one and infinity, the conditional expectation on LP, mapping LP of A to itself, actually to a smaller subspace, but this conditional expectation and this conditional expectation on LP prime are adjoints. You might think, hang on, the conditional expectation was defined as the adjoint of the inclusion map. What gives here? What's the deal? The inclusion map is mapping L the smaller LP space to the larger LP space. Then it's adjoint maps a larger LP space to a smaller LP space. And you can think of that as mapping into the larger LP space. And then when you look at the adjoint of that and you check all the duality relations, you see the conditional expectations are actually self-adjoint. Whatever. I'm not going to prove it. It's in the notes. So now we'll do the last thing of the lecture. I think, yeah, I've got time for this. I'll say proposition, maybe it should be a theorem. Given a probability space. I know I said I wouldn't write it, but too bad. Given your sigma subalgebra. And given a Barnack space with no assumptions on the Barnack space for all X valued integrable random variables that are A measurable. A conditional expectation of F given B exists. And for all P between one and infinity this conditional expectation operator is non-expansive on LP valued in X. And you, yeah, you already know most of the proof. We're just gonna use the abstract extension theorem for, for positive operators to construct it and then just check some properties. But we're gonna to have to, to consider the cases P less than infinity and P equals infinity separately because we don't have these abstract extensions for P equals infinity. We can't use the density of the simple functions for that. We have to argue a little bit differently. So the case where P is less than infinity, we do first. So as I said before, this conditional expectation is positive on LP of A, therefore it admits a bounded X valued extension. And we call this conditional expectation sub X and using the notation that I introduced in the last lecture, this is this tensor extension tilde sub x with respect to x, just to get all the notation straight. Since the conditional expectation that we started with, well, I'm not gonna write it like that. I will write it like this. The norm of this extension on LP mapping to itself is equal to the norm of the the scalar valued operator that we started with 
That was part of the theorem we did in the last lecture for positive operators. And this norm is one. It's a non-expansive, well, not only is it non-expansive, it has norm one. We still need to show that this operator applied to a vector valued random variable F is actually a conditional expectation. Conditional expectation because we don't know that yet. So let's take a set B and we're showing an identity for vector valued functions or for, for vectors. So we just test against all functionals in the dual space and scalarize the thing. Uh, since the function given by testing F against the functional everywhere point-wise is a scalar valued L1 function, which you can check pretty straightforwardly. So when we test this conditional expectation integrated over B, we only test that against a functional. You have this commutation property that lets you put the functional inside the integral that we proved last time. That's step one. Next, we have a certain abstract property of tensor extensions that is an exercise. And I will say exactly which exercise it is. It's exercise 2.7, which you should do. This function here, when you test a, a tensor extended operator against a functional, it's actually the same as taking your original scalar valued function, scalar valued operator and applying it to this function this scalar valued function. That's just an abstract property of tensor extensions. You check it on simple functions. It follows by density. Now we have a scalar valued conditional expectation here and we're integrating it over a set B in B. So you use the defining property of conditional expectations. Like so. And then once more, you use the, the commutation property of Bachner integrals. There you go. Since this is true for every functional X star, you know that these two vectors are equal. And this says that this is actually a conditional expectation of F given B. Is a, let's just say C for conditional expectation of F given the sigma algebra B. That was the case P less than infinity. Why did that not work for P equals infinity? This abstract theorem uses that P is less than infinity. <laughs> we didn't have that theorem for P equals infinity because we didn't have density of the simple functions in the Bochner space L infinity unless X is finite dimensional, which it's not in general. So let's do the case where P is equal to infinity. Quickly skim over this. Is there anything fiddly here? Okay, this isn't too hard, but you have to think a little bit. Let's consider a random variable F. It's in L infinity valued in X. And first we note, okay, this is contained in L2 because we're working with a probability space. We're gonna do something similar to the last proof. We're gonna take, we're gonna reduce it to the L2 situation and use a density argument. So we have our conditional expectation, which is defined, but it's defined as an element of L2 because we're taking the conditional expectation that we defined on L2. And it's defined and we know that it's a conditional expectation, but we just wanna show this L infinity bound. We don't need to show the conditional expectation exists anymore. It does, that's fine. So we just need the L infinity estimate. What we'll use is the norming property of L1 valued in X star as a subset of the dual of L infinity. 
wait, there's no X star here. That's just a, a mark on my notes. Uh, yes, I do want an X star there. I've confused myself. Let's see what we need. L1 is not going to be the dual of L infinity. It's going to be contained in that dual, but it is norming. We can recover L infinity norms by testing against L1. We proved that at some point a few lectures ago, maybe two lectures ago. I can't remember. So let's look at G for all G in L1, B measurable valued in X star, and we're going to intersect that with L2. So actually we're just looking at all G and L2, but we're considering L2 as a dense subset of L1. And we test the norm like we did earlier. We want L infinity control here. So we test against the thing in L1. So this conditional expectation is an abstract tensor extension. Let's just write it like this. It's a tensor extension of a scalar value conditional expectation. And by another exercise, which I will tell you which one it is, exercise 2.8, another abstract property of tensor extensions. Adjoints of tensor extensions are tensor extensions of adjoints. That's the property that we're going to use here. So the adjoint of this tensor extension is the tensor extension of the adjoint. And we're thinking of this as an L2 pairing here because both of these functions are actually in L2. F's in L infinity, which is in L2, and G is in L1 intersect L2 by assumption. So let's say, just put a note here, this is all happening on L2 to make all of this abstract duality work. So now we have the L infinity control we want. This is controlled by the L infinity norm of F by Holder's inequality times the L1 norm of this. And this is valued in the dual space, of course. And we know that the conditional expectation has a nice L1 bound. So this is bounded by the L infinity norm of F, nothing's changed there, times the L1 norm of G. And this is true for all G in L1 intersect L2, which is dense in L1. So since L2 is dense in L1, I don't know if I explicitly showed that for Bochner spaces, but this is not hard to show. Taking the supremum over all G tells you that the L infinity norm of this con conditional expectation is bounded by the L infinity norm of F. And that is all we needed to show. Just a little reminder. So we did the case P less than infinity first. And in particular, this includes the case P equals one. And every LP space on a probability space is contained in L1. So once we did this first case, we got the existence of the conditional expectation automatically for all LP. We just didn't automatically get the L infinity estimate here that we wanted. But it wasn't too hard to show that by density, by duality tricks and so on. Okay, so that's all I wanted to show. So what, just to quickly summarize what I've done since we have an extra couple of minutes. The goal was really this proposition. This was the goal all along. Um, conditional expectations are defined for integrable Barnack valued random variables and they satisfy nice LP non-expansive properties that you'd expect they would. Um, the way that you'd usually prove this for scalar valued functions, you can do this using the, the radon nicotine theorem or the radon nicotine property if your Barnack space has that, which is just the validity of a vector valued radon nicotine theorem. But you don't need to use the radon nicotine theorem to prove this actually. You can do it once you've got it for scalar valued functions. How did I do it for scalar valued functions? Just taking, yeah, using the adjoint of an inclusion, you can construct conditional expectations. If you have the appropriate duality properties of the Bochner spaces, you can also use that to construct them. But that duality is the radon nicotine property in disguise. 
So you're not going to get an easy free proof of this fact without the radon nicotine property. If you want something that holds generally, you use tensor extensions of positive operators, just abstractly. If only this sort of thing worked for every operator, then Barnack valued analysis probably wouldn't exist. <laughs> but it's nice that at least for something as fundamental as conditional expectations, you just have them for free. This lets you do all of the probability theory you'd like to do. Well, maybe not all of it. It lets you define martingales because you need conditional expectations to define martingales. So if we want to define Barnack valued martingales, we better have Barnack valued conditional expectations. And now we have them. But we did need to know a bit about Bochner spaces before we could do that. So all the stuff we did in the previous three lectures was worth something in the end. That'll do. Are there any questions? Yeah, well, uh, I had, but you just said it. I was, I had the remark uh, since I spent the whole last semester talking about martingales. Uh, yeah, I wanted to make the connection between your. Uh, uh, con conditional expectation and the martingales, but you just did it. Also, I missed the first few minutes of today as every Thursday. Did you talk more about the, the dyadic model of... Uh, Not really. The, the first thing I talked about was this whole idea of gambling in Barnack spaces where you flip a coin and you bet a vector and then you get the vector. Which is routine. again nothing but the dyadic martingales on the yeah. real line in disguise. Well, uh, yeah, I did give the example of um, the dyadic filtration. That's right. You did. Okay. Yeah. So but I, I didn't talk about dyadic martingales. Yeah. Yeah. That'll come next time. Yes. Well, you're making great connection with my course last semester. Yep. So. I mean, I didn't see your course, but I saw that you talked a lot about martingales. So, yeah, yeah. And I need to talk a lot about martingales. So that works okay. Yeah. No, no, no. It's okay. Okay. Don't don't change anything for that. I just Good. want to make sure the folks who were there last semester. How many students in this class were in Christoph's harmonic analysis? I see one hand, but I can't see everybody. That's the thing. Let me go to the other screen. That's right. Yeah. I don't know. I guess some people were there. So I guess Christoph would recognize some people. Yeah. Well, I'm clicking through. I'm not quite sure. Yeah. A handful, maybe. Yeah. yeah. Anyway. Yeah. yeah. One thing about this course is that we're going to do all of this like Martingale approach to harmonic analysis, or some of it, and we're going to do it from scratch. So. That's right, which I did. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 no good. So my course is not a precondition, of course. I'm, just, no, no. I'm not really assuming any harmonic analysis. That's the thing. I'm sort of building it up from scratch here anyway, but in Barnock spaces. But it looks sufficiently different from my course, I think. If good. You, know, you should still go to your course. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Anyway, it's not all going to be martingales, but martingales are a pretty fundamental thing in the field. So we've spent quite a bit of time with them. And given that it's all Barnack valued, I mean, not everything in Martingale theory works for Barnack valued functions. Things like sub Martingales are already not really there. Like some of the techniques don't hold. So it's it's going to be sufficiently different from your course for sure. Absolutely. It already yeah. is. And it's uh, a, I know it already is, but it will remain different. Yeah. 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 It's, it's, a, it's a perfect sequence. Yeah. It's, it's is the, is the emphasis in Christoph's course some more like the, the real valued martingales or do you do a lot of... Um, Absolutely. I, I did not have Barnard valued functions. I was just <laughs> uh, scalar valued, maybe complex valued, right? Real or complex. Uh, yeah. No, it was a very basic course in harmonic analysis. But not really with the most standard viewpoint though, from what I've seen. That's right. Yeah. But your course is kind of showing why my point of view wasn't so bad after all. <laughs> because you're going yep. to do the same thing all the time. I mean, this whole big theorem of Bourgain that, um, that the boundedness of the Hilbert transform is equivalent to boundedness of the Martingale difference. This is just my course in disguise, right? In a sense, yeah. Yeah. Although I don't think you would have done that proof because you, no, there's no reason to do, do that proof in the scalar valued setting. Yeah. I'm avoiding anything Barnard valued, absolutely. And, yeah. and the Barnard valued is... Uh, great reason to do a lot of the details that you are doing in detail. Yeah. It's really perfect. One of the things I like about Barnack valued harmonic analysis, and I guess the reason I'm doing it is that it forces you to, to think about harmonic analysis in a very different way. Like you don't have any easy tools. You don't have any Plancherel to work with. You don't have standard orthogonality. You have to really try to dig really deep into every property you use and see what is it that's really making this work. Plancherel is kind of as good as Plancherel is, it's cheating. <laughs> Yeah. I, I, yeah. I, I had no idea that martingales had such good application in, in no, like yeah. this. It's, it's cool to see. <laughs> yeah. 
good. Well, we, 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 we will see it eventually. We will see. I mean, when I first started looking at this, I was amazed that, yeah, probability can do something outside of probability because I have no probability background. So I, I had a very <laughs> yeah. naive view of it. Yeah. And I we still do. Could, so. We could fill a third course next semester doing nothing but probability, I'm sure. We would be talking this Probability same. in general or in Barnard yeah, spaces? Right. <laughs> uh, yeah. I was going to say, I forgot to say, like, probability in Barnack spaces is a research field. Like, there is a book by Ledoux and Talacon called Probability in Barnack Spaces, a nice heavy book, which I've tried to read some of and mostly failed at. And this really is like probability for its own sake, properties of random variables and distributions and stuff. I don't know enough about probability to say what it's truly about. That's which links a lot to high dimensional probability, like probability valued in finite dimensional, but large dimensional spaces. And you get these concentration of measure phenomena and stuff like that that has interesting interpretations when you think of binary spaces, yeah. Well, I should, I should maybe advertise a summer school, hopefully happening next year. It was supposed to happen this year. It's on, uh, on Bougain's work, if you wish. We are trying to honor Bougain. And, I mean, the combined things of, I mean, what you are doing, it's very close to the, the really the, the childhood intuition that Bourguin brought into the field. So Bourguin grew up learning Banach spaces, and then he learned all this stuff, Martin Gens, et cetera, in, when he was uh, in Urbana. And he really took, if you wish, he took this material and uh, made it work in a lot of areas of mathematics. And you mentioned yeah. it, this high dimensional things. Of course, this is also, the, everything you're saying is so much Bourguin. So we'll yeah. be reading a lot of Bourguin's works in the summer school. Uh, so it yeah. will be announced in the, typically in March, maybe, and hopefully we know about Corona by that time. Now we'll plan yeah. Yeah. I think it would be a superb thing to do after having gone through your course. Yeah. I mean, you say that I'm following Bourguin quite a bit, but really I'm following Pizier. Like Pizier has digested Bourguin's arguments right. and presented them in, a, in an easy way. I think both ways, right? Is, is yeah. the, who's, I think Pizier is a little older than Bourguin, right? Yeah. I think so. I don't know exactly. So Bourguin learned a lot from Pizier, I would yeah. say. Uh, and then probably the other way around as well. Oh, way. definitely. Yeah. yeah. Over the years. Of course, be only for, for Bond students. The summer school, you mean? Yeah. The summer school is, no, no, no you can, can come. Okay, please come. Uh, I mean, uh, the hard part will too. It's going to be uh, announced probably on my webpage sometime in March. And the is it going to be Zoom-based or physical? Or do you not know yet? Uh, we decided this year against Zoom-based and we'll probably decide again against Zoom-based. And yeah, it might run into Corona problems. Next yeah, year. and then uh, we'll it's a matter to... of actually getting to Germany. Yeah. One of these then, things yeah. like the actual yeah. school is free, but you don't get your travel well, I'm funded. just hoping that the Corona numbers are so big right now. I mean, even if we don't have vaccination, we will have, everyone will have been infected at least once by next fall, if the numbers stay as they are. Uh, so... We'll see. We'll see. I'm a, I'm a little, uh, yeah, I remain optimistic that next fall will be easier on the call. Or maybe make a summer school really in the middle of summer when uh, when things are low because everyone is outside and uh, the virus. Is... We'll see. We'll see. But but uh, this the whole thing, the whole concept existed already. The whole concept was already on the web, I believe. And you can probably look at it. And it's really, of course, again, in later years, moved away from this in all kinds of fields in mathematics but somehow the way this works is whatever you learned when you were young the intuition you will just keep applying again and again and when you're bogan you learn so much when you were young then <laughs> yeah no no it's, it's just, people, people said i'm crazy running such a summer school because bogan did so many things but there is the precise thing i'd like to shine through this summer school is how things are interlinked given a really good grasp he had about things exactly yeah. like what you're saying. I guess he would have seen this thing on the archive by Terry Tao, which is like a, an overview of Bogan's main ideas, like his well, techniques he, oh, and arguments. Right? Is this part of his, no, it's not part of his obituary, right? It's part of something. I don't know what it's a part of. I just saw it on the archive. Yeah. And well, he, he says like Bogan's got like five or something main yeah. ideas that he always combines in clever ways and doesn't, 
claim that it's only those five ideas, but the five fundamental Borgan ideas and how they combine in different settings. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. And, and it's, uh, it's, it's very close to what you're doing, I would say. Yeah. Okay, anyway, enough of advertising. Let's yeah. Yeah. I'm still recording all this, by the way. So. <laughs> yeah, I've got 22 participants already right here. When it's advertised, I'll definitely forward it on to all the students. I mean, yeah, that's good. Yeah, that's good. If you could, the, the thing is to remember the time uh, to advertise. So yeah. It's a bit, it's first come, first serve usually, and sometimes it's a short period when you get. So the important thing is to be reminded. But yeah, if you could yeah. help me, Alex, that would be great. Yeah, I'll do it.